I first met Jim when he moved from Fratton to Guildford Loco in 1964. I fired to Jim on a number of occasions, one of which was as follows. Whilst working a banana train that we'd worked from Woking to Farnborough with a Q class, number 30541, the locomotive of the 1212 passenger service from Basingstoke to Waterloo came to grief in the up local platform. The shunter asked Jim if we could assist and work the train to Woking. In the meantime, the locomotive, a BR standard class 5MT standard, came off the train and gingerly moved back into the up bay platform. The driver and fireman were Frank Tickner and Bill Brain, and Frank explained he thought one of the piston valves had broken. We then coupled onto the train and worked it tender first to Woking where the train terminated. We looked quite a sight hurtling along through Brookwood. Quite an exciting and eventful day. Jim was always getting into scrapes. One day he accidentally placed a Crompton 1550 horsepower diesel locomotive into the wall at Basingstoke Loco Shed, damaging the pillar next to the sand hole, which also caused a gas leak. Another incident involved working a freight train from Woking Yard with an electro-diesel locomotive, and when being diverted into Waller's Ash Loop, ran past the signal and derailed the locomotive in the process. Both he and his fireman, Ken Earl, jumped from the cab of the moving locomotive before it ran up the sand drag. An inefficient brake force was to blame, and at the inquiry, Jim denied running by the signal. He jumped out first. Great fun to be with. Jim always had an excellent tale to tell. Here are some of his ramblings. Jim started his railway career in April 1949 as an engine cleaner at Ride, Isle of Wight. Many of the Adams O2 tanks that were there at the time were painted in their LSWR passenger sage green livery with black edging and white lining. However, this wasn't his first job. When he left school, Jim started work in a timber yard and was paid 24 shillings a week. Jim found that the railway job was far more lucrative and with overtime and shift allowance, he was paid 50 shillings a week, which made him feel like a millionaire. The junior cleaners were assigned the task of cleaning the inside motion, and the senior cleaners cleaned the boiler and other paint work. In the summer months, there were more special workings on the island, and Jim started his firing career working on Adam's tanks. A typical day's work would involve three trips to Ventnor, 11 trips from Bembridge to Brading, plus trips from Ride to Newport and Ride to Cowes. It was a different railway in those days, and in the height of the summer, there would be around 50,000 to 70,000 passengers coming over on the paddle steamers. Jim can remember being down at the pier one day after doing their three trips to Ventnor, and Mr Gardner, the manager for the line, said there would be another boat coming over from Portsmouth and asked Jim's driver if they would do an additional trip to Ventnor. Jim's driver agreed, but Jim hadn't long been married and pointed out that his wife would be worrying about him being late home. Mr Gardner said to Jim, Where do you live, boy? And Jim replied, Nelson Street, sir. And Mr Gardner said, Don't worry, it's on my way home, and duly informed Jim's wife that he'd be working late. Jim's national service loomed, and he was called up to join the Royal Engineers, and ended up as a hospital cook at the Cambridge Hospital order shop. Jim was quite happy to serve his country overseas on the mainland, so to speak, often coming back home on a weekend pass. On return from his national service, Jim filled a fireman's vacancy at Newport Depot, Isle of Wight, and worked on Brighton tank locomotives. There were only three pair of men there, and Jim spent most of his time working coal trains from Medina Wharf, near Cowes, up to Newport on an early turn and late turn, and another coal train they worked was to ride. This served the gas works there. They worked a full load of 40 10-ton loaded wagons with a Brighton tank engine, and this was hard work. A full head of steam and off you'd go. Jim's driver, he recalls, was a funny old boy who smoked woodbine cigarettes. To economise, he'd cut them in half and hold them to his lips with a pin. Unfortunately, the line eventually closed and in 1955 Jim became redundant. 
The following map shows the main sections and branches of train lines in the Isle of Wight. Trains often ran between sections. There was a very popular semi-fast name train, the Tourist, which ran from Ventnor, town, to Sandown, via Merstone to Newport. It then reversed and continued to Freshwater. The existing electric line has two additional stops at Lake between Shanklin and Sandown and Smallbrook between Brading and St John's Road. There was originally a station at Lake, not on the site of the present station, but was closed well before 1948. Newport was effectively two separate stations with a pedestrian walkway. Dave Parker adopted the style of Henry Beck and produced a unique diagrammatic version of the island's railway system. Henry Beck invented the concept of railway maps in this style in 1933 and changed forever people's perception of the geography of London. It's perhaps not so far out of place as ex-London underground tube trains still run on the island. This view shows O2 class number 17, Sea View, as she returns to Ride Pier Head with a 1340 from Ventnor on the 28th of August 1965. On the right is a petrol driven tram car returning to the Esplanade. Another picture of number 17, Sea View, arriving at Ride Esplanade Station, X Pier Head, on the 11th of October 1964. The tram car can just be seen on the left of the photograph. Bordered with wild primroses, O2 class number 20, Shanklin, heads for cows beyond Smallbrook Junction on the 24th of April 1965. O2 class number 14, Fishbourne, waits as the electric tokens are exchanged through the opposite train's open window at Roxall to allow the train into the next single line section. The photographer's son looks spellbound as he peers into the cab of X-Works 02 class number 28 Ashy at Ventnor Station on the 25th of April 1964. No wonder he looks interested all those controls, handbrake, regulator, injector valves, reverser, brake handle, boiler water level gauge glasses, steam pressure gauge, main air reservoir gauge, steam heat pressure gauge, and most importantly, the whistle. O2 class number 29, Alverstone, runs round the train at Ventnor before setting off back to ride with a return service. The crew have a chat before they depart with O2 class number 21, Sandown, and their train from Ventnor to Ride on the 17th of July 1965. A lady makes an overseas call in the phone box at Ventnor on the 28th of June 1959 as O2 class number 24, Calbourne, runs round the train for its return working. Press button A please. Jim decided to apply for a vacancy at Guildford Motor Power Depot, which was successful, and he became a fireman in the top link with driver Bill Hill, known as Inspector. His first firing term was on a T9 class, and following that a Cathedral class, and he remembers feeling rather scared of these large engines, that he'd often only fired to Adams tanks before. He also worked over the Bentley to Borden branch line, and had a variety of stopping freight turns to Reading and up the new line, most stations having their own goods yard. One day, Jim was with a driver called George Nurse, and they had a bit of time before they left Clandon Station Yard. They both noticed some wild strawberries growing on the side of the embankment, so Jim went up there and picked a hatful. After having eaten them, a plate layer came up and said to George, is that right you've been up the bank pinching my strawberries? And George replied, strawberries? I can't stick the taste of them. Can you, fireman? Jim also answered, no. And it's a good job he didn't look up on the footplate, as there were bits of strawberries all over the floor of the cab. 
Rebuilt Battle of Britain class number 34060-25 Squadron suffers a signal check at Clandon before making her way to Guildford and eventually Southampton with a diverted special passenger service. Jim passed his driving exam first time, his examiner being Mr George Pemberton who asked him questions about the locomotive in the morning and about the rules and regulations in the afternoon. Not long after that, Jim successfully applied for a driver's vacancy at Nine Elms and worked there for three years, two of these being in the Salisbury gang, which he thinks was number three link. They had 12 turns and 10 of those turns during the summer were down the Salisbury Road, which was really nice work. On one of the turns, you'd sign on and work the 4.45am Waterloo to Woking with a three-coach set and vans, shunt them into East End sidings and drop the vans off and then away to Salisbury. After a short break, they would then work the 7.30am Exeter from Salisbury to Andover, then fast to Waterloo. The train was nearly always headed by a bullied light Pacific locomotive. On one occasion they ran into Andover and as they stopped the safety valves released and a big cloud of pickled water caused by the water softening briquettes was emitted from the safety valve and landed onto Smith's bookstool. The lady in charge was waving her arms around like a windmill and alleged afterwards that there were several hundred pounds worth of damage caused to the books. Once, working the 9.33am from Salisbury to Waterloo, which usually arrived at 11.08am, Jim ran into Waterloo a bit too fast, and Jim thought to himself, I'm running in too fast here, so he dropped the handle and put his feet up on the front of the boiler as he thought for sure they were going to hit the blocks. Luckily, they screeched to a stop, and Jim got off the engine with his knees knocking and found that he'd stopped about six inches short from the buffers. Jim worked the same train a few days later and at Waterloo was informed by several train enthusiasts that were riding in the train that their speed had been about 106 to 108 mile an hour between Hook and Fleet. They were suitably impressed. After being at Nine Elms for three years, Jim decided to move back near his roots and transferred to Fratton Motor Power Depot and it was from here that he drove trains across the Hailing Island branch. Quite often they had to extinguish fires on Hailing Bridge in the summer months. Two A1X class locomotives, number 32636 and number 32670, stand over the ash pits at Fratton Shed on the 3rd of November 1963. Driver Brian Sessions, who also previously worked at Guildford Motor Power Depot, stands on the footplate of number 32636. With the train packed full of holiday makers, A1X class number 32646 makes her way back towards Haven on the 25th of June 1961. A1X class number 32662 heads another service and makes her way from Haven to Hailing Island the same day in 1961. Jim only had one disaster whilst being a driver at Fratton. They had a turn where they went to Eastleigh in the morning and relieved a Q1 class, a Charlie. The locomotive had been out all night and the fire was absolutely dirty with about six inches of clinker on the fire bars. Anyway, they left Eastleigh with about 60 wagons on for Fratton and the locomotive became so low on steam near Porchester they had to stop several times for a blow up. There was nothing for it but to clean the fire, which caused quite a delay of about two and a half hours. They eventually limped round to Fratton, which resulted in a lot of Portsmouth football supporters missing some of the game that their team was playing at Southampton. After a year at Fratton, Jim moved depots yet again and returned to Guildford Motor Power Depot for the last three years of steam working. It was during this time that he was rostered into the dual link which meant that he would sometimes be booked to cover drivers from the surrounding electric depots, Guildford, Woking, Aldershot, Farnham and Effingham Junction. He'd also learnt the 1550 horsepower Type 3 Crompton diesel-electric locomotive, 
and the 1600-600 horsepower electro-diesel locomotive, where they had firemen acting as second men. One of Jim's regular firemen was Roger Hope, and they would play all sorts of tricks on each other. On one occasion, Jim placed some risque pictures and an empty condom packet in his empty plastic lunchbox without him knowing, and the next day Roger was not amused after being in trouble with his mum. Jim only worked over the Guildford to Horsham branch a couple of times. The top link had most of the Reading Red Hill passenger work, but he occasionally worked Waterloo to Southampton docks boat trains, as he was already familiar with these routes whilst working at Nine Elms. Towards the end of steam, the Reading to Red Hill line was worked by Hampshire diesel units, nicknamed Tadpoles, and one day whilst working over to Red Hill on the approach to a farm crossing between Gompshaw and Dorking, a tractor went over the crossing in front of him. Jim slammed on the brakes but just caught the tractor a glancing blow with the tractor driver jumping off for his life. After he stopped, Jim went back to see if he was all right and the tractor driver said, you won't report it, will you? Jim said no, he wouldn't report it, so long as you're all right. When Jim got back to the diesel unit, he found the best part of the running board on the leading coach was missing. Jim thinks the Reading Red Hill line was his favourite, a very pretty line. Rebuilt Battle of Britain class number 34052, Lord Dowding, has just replenished her tender at the water column situated on the country end of the Down Cobham platform before continuing its journey with an SCTS 4 County special to Southampton via Havant and Fareham. Guildford fireman John Bundy looks on as the train starts its journey. A group of photographers at the end of the platform wait to capture the moment. Battle of Britain class number 34052 Lord Dowding with Feather Flying heads towards Farncombe with an SCTS Four Counties special on the 9th of July 1966. Driver Jim Wattleworth and fireman Ken Earl are in charge. An ideal choice for the Guildford roster clerk, as Jim was previously based at Fratton Motor Power Depot and was already conversant with the route. I first met Eric when I was a young fireman at Guildford and he was also stationed as a goods guard there at that time. Always cheerful, he was a person you could rely on and performed his job to the highest level. Here are some of Eric's tales that he relayed to me from when he first started work on the railway as a porter at Petersfield. Eric William George Nelson Hearn Eric was born on Trafalgar Day on the 21st of October 1932 and carried the name Nelson due to the date. He attended junior and senior schools at Petersfield and upon leaving school he worked for a local electrical firm endeavouring to obtain an apprenticeship but no one gave him any backing. Eric was then called up to do his national service with the Royal Artillery and had to report to Osbestry. After initial training he went to Ryle until 30th of September 1953. After that, Eric commenced work for British Railways as a porter at Petersfield Station, having successfully passed an interview at Wimbledon, where the Southern Region Head Offices were situated. At the time, there were four porters at Petersfield, two senior porters, one person in the parcels office, one early and one late turn, three booking office clerks, an admin man, three signalmen and two shunters. One of the shifts that Eric worked was from 5am to 1pm, the work consisting of sweeping the up and down line platforms and the tunnel which connected the two platforms. On some occasions, Eric was involved with the Midhurst platform, which was situated at the north end of Petersfield Station. Usually another porter was employed for that platform, but sometimes Eric would be required to attend there, usually on a Saturday or a Sunday. Another duty was to clean all of the windows on the station, including the station master's office. In the winter months, Eric would have to light coal fires in the waiting rooms, staff rooms, etc., 
and sometimes there was a difficulty in finding wood, so short ends of sleepers were used which were chopped up in the yard. During train running times, duties also involved unloading parcels, cycles etc, also baskets of pigeons, making sure that when liberated a fast train wasn't in the vicinity. The empty baskets were then returned to their home stations. At that time, quite a lot of fast trains passed through Petersfield without stopping. Twice a day, a milk train had to be loaded, as of an adjacent milk dairy, and 10 gallon churns were loaded onto PMV wagons. One day, one of the trains departed for Hailing Island, for one of the holiday camps and some of the lids of the churns came off and a large quantity of milk was spilt, much to the annoyance of the dairy. A lad called Roger Mills had a trick played on him once. His confederates placed him into two milk churns, one leg in each. Four churns of milk would go onto the Midhurst line for Rogate, and because the steep approach to the platform was made of wooden sleepers and was about nine feet high, a run was needed to reach it. In the wet or icy weather, this was not an easy task. The barrow containing the four churns would be pushed by two staff towards the Midhurst platform and it was quite often necessary to stand in the middle of the road on the level crossing and take a run at it to get up the platform. Bean and pea sticks, sugar beet and Christmas trees were just some of the commodities that would be offloaded from the Midhurst line trains. There were five or six trains a day operating on the line at that time and were push-pull fitted, the locomotives invariably coming off the train upon arrival to replenish its water tanks. On the last inbound trip, it was often the case that the three-coach set would be shunted onto the main line, the loco would be shunted onto the other end of the train and the whole ensemble would make its way back to Guildford. Two years later, in October 1955, Eric applied for a job as a train shunter. This consisted of putting coal, sugar beet, fish and milk wagons into their correct positions for loading and unloading in the goods yard at Petersfield, so that lorries and even horse-drawn carts in that period could easily make a collection. After the wagons were emptied or loaded, they would be dispatched to Guildford. There was an abundance of sugar beet traffic to the extent of 25 wagons coming into Petersfield and then returning during the summer months. Coal stock was kept in the upyard and four coal merchants were sighted there. The coal wagons needed to be placed in the pens correctly. Sometimes a tip would be forthcoming. A wire fencing firm was sighted at Petersfield station and wagon loads of steel wire would appear. They had a dock for one and a half wagons adjacent to their premises and one wagon would easily be accommodated but the other one would present some difficulty to unload. Once a week a Gerda firm loaded wagons with their products. The yard at Petersfield was a very busy place for the shunter, there being early and late turn shifts. About 10.20am a freight train would depart for Rowlands Castle and also to Haven and quite often it was necessary for Eric to join the train and assist with the unloading at the two stations. Churns of water would also be made available to be dropped off for the crossing keepers at Idworth and Ditcham, as their premises were not connected to the main water supply. Local farmers would arrive, forming a queue to offload their sugar beet. Sometimes 10 to 12 lorries or tractors would arrive. The farmers were experts at transferring their loads speedily some 25 wagons would be loaded for dispatch to the Midlands. Fish trains often frequented Petersfield, one in the early morning and one mid-morning. It proved quite a task to clean out these wagons and often boxes were broken and needed to be burnt. Broken goods needed to be reported to the goods office and often a breakfast of kippers was enjoyed from the contents of the broken boxes. In 1958, the Petersfield to Midhurst branch line closed and the goods traffic fell away dramatically. Redundancy loomed and an offer of a job at Guildford presented itself for Eric, initially as an acting goods guard. The various roads and yards had to be learned and after some 10 to 12 weeks of tuition, 
it became possible for Eric to work alone. Eric's first job as a goods guard entailed working a 61 wagon freight train from Reading to Red Hill. The first 10 wagons were vacuum brake fitted and the rest were loose coupled. As they went up Gomshall Bank, the load proved too much for the locomotive, but fortunately the Conti, the Hook Continental Express, was the next train to follow them, and the Gomshall signalman was alerted for the train to assist. The Western Region driver in charge of the Birkenhead, Dover train, remarked, Of course, you southern blokes are hopeless. You don't know how to run trains at all. The guards van took full force of the Western Region's locomotive assisting them up the bank, and once over the summit, their troubles were eased. On another occasion, it was necessary to travel back passenger from Red Hill to Guildford. Fortunately, Eric thought, a light locomotive, the T9 class, was available and the crew invited him aboard. What Eric didn't realise at the time was that it was to travel tender first and the coal dust was blowing off the tender all the way to Guildford. When a serious railway incident occurred at Lewisham on the 4th of December 1957, a lot of trains were diverted via Reading and Red Hill and often at Didcot it was proposed to take as many wagons as possible with a fervent plea to take even more in order to clear the backlog. In the opposite direction, numerous trains consisting of loads of cement were operated. Drivers of these trains often stopped at Shalford instead of Guildford to take water in order to get a run at the incline from Guildford to Pink's Hill, which was documented in Pat Kinsella's story, Snoddle and Cement. Signing on at Guildford at 4am for a goods train to Petersfield at 5.15am was ideal in the summer months, but a different outlook was experienced in the depth of winter. It was necessary to light a fire in the guard's van stove, and should the previous occupant not have left any coal, a search would ensue to obtain some which proved quite unpleasant upon a cold, miserable morning. Quite often, warmth was not experienced until almost reaching Petersfield, and if the coal was wet, the brake van would resemble a steam bath with the dampness. A can of tea was imperative, and this could be kept warm on the stove, but this was down to the driver of the locomotive giving you a smooth ride. Otherwise, the can would be dislodged with disastrous results. In the early morning, you'd see plenty of wildlife alongside the track. Deer, foxes, rabbits, etc. Especially when ascending Hazelmere Bank. And at night, hundreds of glowworms would also be seen there. On the return trip from Petersfield, shunting took place at Liss, Liphook and Hazelmere, before proceeding to Godalming and Guildford. Liss used to have Demerara sugar offloaded and the wagons would be shunted onto the Longmore military railway sidings. It was wise to be alert for bees and wasps. Ammunition was placed onto the trains at Liss, and tanks and military lorries were often loaded at Lippock. It was always desirable to marshal these next to the locomotive, as part of the fitted brake portion. Occasionally at Liss, one of the Longmore military railway locomotives would assist with the shunting. At Hazemere, the train was placed in the siding, and traffic there mainly consisted of coal. A colleague guard at Guildford experienced a problem while shunting at Hazemere. The procedure was to shunt from the up yard to the down yard and leave the train just inside the ground signal clear of the main line. The locomotive would then proceed to pick up the rest of the empty coal wagons and place them in the yard where required. The procedure was followed but four wagons were not coupled onto the main part of the train and left with their brakes not pinned down. Because of the severe gradient, this resulted in the four loaded coal wagons running away travelling right line all the way through Lippock and Liss, passing over numerous railway crossings until their momentum decreased at King's First and Crossing, situated on the London side of Petersfield Station, where they eventually came to a halt a distance of some 11 miles. Eric also worked freight trains over the Horsham branch for Bramley, Cranley, Rudwick and Slinfold stations. Apart from taking water at Christ Hospital, no shunting was experienced and upon arrival at Horsham, time was allowed for them to visit the canteen, 
which served splendid meals at a very reasonable price. A few wagons would be brought back from Horsham and upon arrival at Baynard's, wagons of full as earth would be attached. Sometimes due to the Guildford line only being a single line, it became necessary to visit the Thurlow Arms at Baynard's for light refreshments. Eric told me he really enjoyed his life on the railway. He said he could never have worked in an office from nine to five.